Katie, take it away. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, hi, welcome to Indiana Kids Count, the 2020 census at your library. As Beth said, I'm Katie Springer. I've been with the Indiana State Data Center Program for 13 years at the State Library. I'm a government information and data librarian. And uh, what I primarily do at the State Library is I help patrons hunt down data and public use data sets uh, and help with their research um, when it comes to specifically finding statistics. Uh, to uh, enhance and inform their research. Part of what I do also in this job at the State Data Center is to promote awareness of the census and what it does. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about why it's important and then we'll share ideas about reaching out to patrons about the census. This presentation is a variation of the presentations I've been doing for the past year on the 2020 census. So if you have attended any of those presentations, you'll hear some familiar things and you'll hear some new things. So feel free to um, ask me questions throughout the presentation. So to start off with, the goal of the census is to count everyone living in the United States in one place at one time. Census Day is customarily on April 1st every decade, and it's no different this time around. As librarians, we are trusted voices in our communities, and we can help people understand the value of filling out the census, even if it takes them a little extra effort. Here are several re reminders of why we fill out the census. First, the census is used to apportion seats in the U.S. House of Representatives as mandated in the Constitution. Each human being in the United States depends on these numbers for fair representation. The financial part of the picture, which is mentioned a lot in the 2020 census uh, promotional materials, is that this data drives how billions of dollars of federal and state funding is allocated to communities for neighborhood improvements, public health, education, transportation, and much more. That's more than $5 trillion over a 10-year period. So in the long run, this can determine decisions about where libraries are built, where services for the elderly are provided, and what job training centers are offered. The more we're able to help patrons see their part in this process, the greater impact we can have on our community's well-being and our quality of life. For this census, everyone will have the option of completing it how they would like to complete it, starting in mid-March of this year. You can do it online through the computer or smartphone. You can do it through the usual mailback process on paper form, or you can fill it out over the phone with a Census Bureau representative. The census will be available online for the first time in history and also in print in 13 languages and in Braille. The Census Bureau also provides online guides for completing the census in 59 languages other than English, including American Sign Language in video and in print. State and local organizations will share responsibilities for working with the Census Bureau to provide additional translation assistance to their own communities when needed. New for the 2020 census is a question um, that, as usual, it will ask about race, but what's different this time is that it's going to allow a write-in self-response box with enough, enough characters for multiple races and ethnicities to be listed by hand. The census over the years, since 1790, has been um, al allowing people to self-respond. So it's one of those surveys that relies on self-response and um, one of the things that is important about this new um, fill-in on race and ethnicity is that it provides more options for self-identifying for um, multiple and mixed races and ethnicities. So why is it important that we count everyone? In November, the Census Bureau issued a brief 
describing the undercount of young children in the last census in, in 2010, it stated that nearly 1 million children, um, which 4.6% 4, 4 of children under the age of five um, living in the United States, uh, remained uncounted during the census. So that's 1 million children that may not have received services they needed because these numbers are based on the decennial census. This, this means that during the 2020 census, we have this extra challenge ahead of us. Families with children under five will need to be counted accurately so that federal and state funding is correctly guided toward those areas that it is needed that serve children under five throughout the decade. So how can we as librarians help? The ALA has several resources. So I've put those together on this one slide, and you can return to this after the um, webinar uh, for future reference. ALA issued a library's guide to the 2020 census last May, um, and they've also issued a tip sheet for how libraries can help count all kids in the 2020 census. The guide explains basic census operations that Census Bureau employees are responsible for and it details how more than 320 million people will receive census materials. The ALA mentions many people who are at risk of being undercounted in the census, and it outlines Census Bureau efforts in traditionally undercounted communities. Late last year, the ALA issued a blog post with the National Count All Kids campaign, and I've put the Facebook link to the Count All Kids campaign on this slide. Um, this, they have worked with the Census Bureau to develop outreach materials, and their website is an excellent resource if you need more information on that committee. Also on this slide, you'll see why some of the, um, the, um, the ideas about why some children are likely to be missed um, within uh, your community. So they may live in large or more complex households that receive the survey, uh, they may live with single parents um, or younger parents who don't know the importance of filling out the census. They may uh, not be the biological or they may be an adopted child of the householder, so that may affect the way the householder fills out uh, the census. They may live with grandparents, aunts and uncles, or other family members. Uh, they may live with families that do not speak English um, and so maybe don't know uh, when the survey comes in, uh, what the importance of it is. Their family may include Im immigrants. They may live in poor families or low-income households, and their families may rent rather than own their home. So these are all factors that tie into why children have been missed in the census before. Um, I did mention that um, we focus on that fact that the 2010 census undercounted a large number of children, um, but a recent uh, announcement that the director of the Census Bureau, Steve Dillingham, d did um, in, in uh, a, uh, a PR session for the beginning of the census in Alaska, which just happened this January, um, they start enumeration there because of the remote households. They actually have to do a lot more extra work to get to them. Um, but what he said was that young children have actually been undercounted in every census. So it is, it's, a pro, it's a problem that um, as uh, residents of the United States, it's important that we're aware of this so that we make sure that people are um, filling out the census correctly. Most of the outreach I've done, um, and I've mentioned to groups, is at low to no cost. So librarians can do many things to help get the word out about the census. We can promote reliable information by handing out flyers from the Census Bureau and other trusted sources in our communities. Earlier this year, the Census Bureau released its 2020 Census Promotional Guidelines with instructions on using the 2020 Census logo um, and detailed guidelines so that you can build your own uh, Census Bureau materials um, and 2020 Census outreach flyers. We can help increase awareness by doing displays. Uh, on this slide, I have one of the displays we did at the State Library called 50 Years of Advances in the U.S. Census. 
Um, we're going to be a, doing a display very shortly in the Great Hall, so we're going to expand that to a few um, a few more uh, solid displays with posters and uh, make it uh, an historical display where we have uh, materials from um, almost every census going back to 1790, so that'll be fun to see. And of course, you don't, do not have to be that extensive because we know every library doesn't have historical materials, really anything that gets the word out that the census is going to be sent out via mail um, in uh, mid-March. And, and, and again, the um, I have a detailed scheduling, and I don't put it on any of these slides, but there's a detailed schedule of when the mailings occur. So that mid-March mailing is going to be a letter that everybody gets. Um, and as far as I um, have been told, it, it will be addressed to the actual address that you live in, but it may say, um, it may not have the exact name, it may say something like resident or householder. So um, be sure that people do know that so that they don't absentmindedly, absentmindedly throw that uh, piece of mail away. Uh, it will say the US Census Bureau um, on the return, um, uh, space for the return on the mail. That first mailing will only have um, an invitation to fill out the census online. So it's not going to be the actual paper form. It's going to have a code that's um, tied directly to that address that uh, you can put in uh, when you go to fill out the census online. Then there will be a series of reminders um, to remind people to fill out the census online. And then uh, they'll send out uh, another mailing to the households that have not filled it out online that actually does uh, include that paper form. So when the time comes, um, you probably by uh, even that second or third week of April after Census Day, you'll be able to talk to people and say, did you guys get anything in the mail? Did, did you receive that reminder to fill out the census online? Um, and you'll be able to actually have conversations with people about the mailings. Because, in fact, after that, that initial mailing of the, um, the invitation, there are five or six different mailings that happen if people opt not to fill it out um, because those mailings uh, happen to the households that have not completed it yet. So we, um, those displays, the, even just those uh, conversations we have with people are important. Um, the Census Bureau provides guides and toolkits for reaching out to specific groups in your communities on the 2020census.gov website. So you can go there for all of their materials. Um, we have also put together a toolkit specifically for Indiana librarians. So you can access this on the Census in Indiana website under Promotional Toolkits. And some of the elements of this toolkit include a census timeline, uh, the talking points for Indiana libraries, if you want to have that ready at the desk uh, or in groups um, that you uh, serve, FAQs for Indiana libraries, ideas and suggestions for displays, events, and programs, some of which you'll see uh, in, in these slides. These are focused on young families. And the 2020 Census online resource list. And that resource list is, um, it, it has all of the digital links on it. So you can either print it out or you can just use it um, on your computer to access all of the, um, the websites that you need for these resources. So um, also included in that toolkit are suggestions from our Young Readers Center. Uh, and Tara Stewart, who works in the State Library um, YRC uh, was generous enough to offer uh, specific books and activities for reaching out to young children and families. So this is just an example of some of the um, books that are included. Mouse Count by Ellen Stoll Walsh, which introduces and reinforces counting down and up to 10. A Place for Zero, A Math Adventure by Angeline Lopresti which views the number zero's place as a character and lets him learn that every number counts, which is a good tie-in to everyone counts. Mm -hmm. And All Are Welcome by Alexandra Penfold-Multi 
and Introduction to Inclusiveness and Diversity. These suggestions in the toolkit for books and activities are divided by subject. So they're divided by accounting, math, sociology, and geography. So you can kind of choose from those. And um, they're just the beginning of suggestions. You don't have to necessarily follow exactly these activities, but they're just to get your mind working so that you can create these activities for people, um, especially when it comes to the, the time right before the census um, in uh, the end of February, beginning of March. One of the events detailed in the toolkit is our program from um, last year called Get on the Map. Uh, we did this program for the Vigo County Public Library where there were some of the lowest response rates um, for Indiana during the 2010 census. So we partnered with the Geography Educators Network of Indiana, or GENI, to make this happen. We provided two sessions, one for homeschool families at the main library in the morning, and then one for after-school drop-in students at the West Terre Haute branch in the afternoon. Our 45-minute program used geography, math, and storytelling to explain why it's so important that we get an accurate count of the people in our communities. The response was highly positive. We had several parents thank us for it, and library staff were equally enthused. Um, this is uh, a picture of the traveling floor map, which is available for checkout through Genie. You can borrow it from Kathy, who is right there in the middle of that photo in the green sweatshirt. And what she does is she, um, uh, this map folds up and, and rolls up, and it, it is in this giant duffel bag. It also comes with a trunk full of materials and books um, and curriculum uh, guides for anybody that would want to use the traveling map wherever they are in Indiana. I have a question. Yes. So how would, would, does she come with the program then? Or just, do they just loan the yeah, map? Yeah, she just loans the map okay. out. So it was basically up to me to kind of create the program with her. Okay. But she, as she's the um, director of the Geography Educators Network of Indiana, and actually on their website, they have a ton of different map activities. So if you would want to borrow this map from her, um, there are so many different ideas that have already been drummed up about activities on the map. Um, and uh, for the 2020 census and after, this is a really valuable um, tool for our programs. It's a lot of fun to use. And the, the kids seem to really respond to it. It's, a, it's one of those hands-on, you know, very interactive activities that uh, get them excited to learn about genealogy. And I just threw uh, the... Sorry, geography. <laughs> I just threw the... Um, the website for that program up Great. on the chat. Okay, thank you. They have uh, both an old website and a new website, mm -hmm. so if you have any trouble um, navigating those, just uh, you can email me or contact me, or and of course you can email uh, or contact Kathy as well. So you can get additional ideas for library activities from the Statistics in Schools program from the Census Bureau, and that's at census.gov slash schools, and I meant to put that URL on the slide, um, but it's basically just part of the Census Bureau website. Yeah, that's, um, that's the URL uh, that Beth has provided for you there. There are 2020 census resources, and you'll, you'll find a link to the 2020 resources in, a, um, in a, uh, an orange button on their website, and it's divided into pre-K, K through 12, and English language learner materials. So some of the activities here include census questionnaires, then and now, which lets students look at historical census questionnaires from 1900, and then it compares them with the 2010 census so that they can kind of see the difference between what was asked 100 years ago and what's asked today. So this idea can be used either as a display or an activity um, with young families. There's also conducting your own census in the classroom, which you can modify as a library activity. So you can actually have um, the, uh, the kids conduct a census of people in the library or conduct a census of something that's not typical of, uh, of the census, like conduct a a count of the chairs in the library, which is akin to counting a lot of things that um, have to be counted. And 
um, so that you can make it kind of an interactive thing about counting and why is it important to count these things? Why is it important that we know how many of this thing are in are in the library? And um, the other thing that we want to make sure that people have access to is the social media um, streams that exist right now through both the Census Bureau and the State Data Center. This is an, a good way to engage older children um, and teens as well as parents in the 2020 Census um, and to get families prepared for it once it does start to happen in March. These are the links to the sites that are most active with 2020 Census posts um, and um, the Census Bureau's links are there and my Indiana State Data Center links are there. Uh, which I, I manage all of those posts, our Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest page. Um, if you are on social media, then you can find um, many different Census Bureau partners. Um, the, the decennial census is, the Census Bureau calls it, the largest um, peacetime non-military activity of the residents of the United States. It's one of those really enormous um, operations that the government does. So many, many partners go into conducting and um, uh, making sure that the 2020 census is uh, made aware of. So you'll find many different social media accounts have 2020 census posts on them. And we encourage you to share those on social media uh, and um, partner with any of your um, either uh, local government or nonprofit organizations within your community to get the word out about the 2020 census. You can also sign up for email updates at the bottom of the 2020 census partnership website um, or for more detailed updates about census data itself you can join the state data center listserv and I maintain that you can email me for more information about that. Just remember to check social media, check the 2020 Census in Indiana website, um, and ask questions if you need to know more. And if you have questions now, uh, I can answer them. Please don't hesitate to contact me at the State Library. I'm here every day. And uh, you can either call or email me um, if you're not in Indianapolis. Thank you, and please, uh, I'm here if you have any questions. Yeah, we'll take questions now. Is anybody um, already planning any census programs at their library that they would want to share with us? Or if you work in a school, maybe you're doing some, um, some activities in the school. <laughs> no response yet? No response yet. No well, um, one of the things that I, I did want to mention uh, before uh, the end of the webinar is that I did a more detailed Help Our Kids Count in the 2020 Census webinar through the geography um, education network that we have here in Indiana. The Indiana Geographic Information Council actually hosted the other webinar. And one of the things we did was we used a Census Bureau tool called ROAM, R-O-A-M, and if you go to the um, Census Bureau's website, you can find ROAM. And one of the things it does is it lets you drill down into each community in Indiana and see where there are low response scores. So you can look at the response scores and see um, where uh, to the neighborhood level, um, a community might need um, a little bit more outreach um, and more energy might um, be uh, positive into making sure that in the 2020 census, um, people know more about the census and that it is easy, safe, and important. That safety issue is one of those uh, issues that is increasingly um, important to um, reinforce that this is a safe survey. It's done by the federal government um, and they're using uh, the most um, up-to-date cybersecurity software that's available. 
this is also um, one of the things that uh, a, a lot of people walking in will have questions about. When you go to a computer to fill out your census, um, is it uh, clear that there's going to be no information um, that just goes out to the internet? You know, a lot of people don't exactly trust the internet yet uh, for filling out things like this. So it's, it's important that we reassure people that um, the site is secure and it isn't, um, your information is not going to be shared via the internet. Um, and again, uh, with the question about the citizenship question being added or not added to the, the 2020 census, the Supreme Court decision was made that it would not be added, but because of that controversy, there was a lot of, um, there, there's still a lot of fear uh, that is um, there about filling out the census, and so we're we're here to provide information to people that this is a, a safe um, survey to fill out, and that um, federal law, Title 13 of the U.S. Code, protects uh, people's information. One of the things that um, we try to reiterate is that it um, is a federal law that protects your data from being shared with. Uh, anyone, not uh, not any coworkers, uh, not any other state agency, not a, any other federal agency. Um, it stays with the Census Bureau uh, for 72 years. So, and any any um, genealogists in the um, in this group, uh, you'll know that a couple of years after the census is taken, the 1950 census will be available. So that's another thing that many library patrons will be interested in knowing is that they'll be able to see um, their relatives or any, any family history they're working on in the 1950 census in a couple of years. Can you um, maybe share a little bit more about how the census can directly affect libraries, um, be it funding or, um, gosh, any other ways that you can think of? Why, why everybody should care? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that we talk about is um, why uh, why libraries are affected by um, the census, and um, one of the things that we uh, do at the State Data Center is we provide um, public information at public libraries, and part of that process is that we are funded by a federal agency. So all of the programs that I do um, to let people know about public data, they, they all depend upon um, federal money and we rely on those census data to determine how many people we have to serve. So if people don't get counted in the right way, um, and especially young families, if those, those families are left out, then um, we don't have a program to, um, to, to serve people. We have to have those accurate numbers so that we get the right amount of dollars to serve people. I would also throw in that for librarians specifically, like the IMLS LSTA grants, the money that's awarded to each state is determined, I'm sure, by probably population, right? Mm -hmm. So the census directly affects that too. So if your library is looking into or hopeful about getting like a library services or library science technology act grant, um, that that money can be affected. So that's yet another reason why it's really important. A lot of libraries count on that money to supplement what they're doing. Very true. So yeah. Any any other questions, comments, um, things you were surprised by? plans you have. Nobody's chatting today. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Uh, we, we really um, appreciate you tuning in. I'm uh, available at any time to help people answer questions. You will have people coming in to fill out the census at your library. Um, and uh, we have detailed information about what we can do as census partners. Uh, and not what we're not necessarily responsible for. So there's always, a, you know, one step further that that um, that you can go in in finding out more information about 
um, what we're responsible for as librarians uh, in the 2020 census. And please contact me anytime at the State Library. All right. Well, I'm going to pull up now the form. So here at the top, you can see there's the LEU certificate for the Census 2020 webinar. And then that PDF, Indiana Kids Count PDF, that is um, Katie's slides in a PDF form. So any of the links that were in there, as I mentioned in the chat, you should be able to click on and go straight to. Um, also, kind of halfway down, you'll see evaluation semicolon and then a link to SurveyMonkey, and that is an evaluation link um, that we ask that you fill out for us so we know how we're doing. And then at the very bottom is our email addresses, both uh, for me and for Katie. Um, so thank you, Katie, for doing this, and I hope you guys learned a little bit more about the census. Got a couple of ideas for things you can do to incorporate it into like story time and other programming. And um, just generally, I hope you go forth and encourage your patrons um, wherever they need encouraging to fill out the census because it's so important to us all. Oh, yay, Melissa. She says she works with the youngest kids and she'll share it with some of their parents. Love the book suggestions in the map. Yeah, great. it's a great resource. All right, everybody, we're going to go uh, radio silent. But again, thank you so much for coming. And we'll stay in here for just a few minutes. So if you do have any questions, you can still type them in there. We'll still be here for a minute um, or email us directly. All right, thank you so much.